Hello and welcome to the Comlex Instant Review. Let's talk about various infectious diseases, especially non-bloody diarrhea. I want to start out by talking about the Rota and the Norwalk virus. And most cases are self-limited. Um, the common things you want to look for for Rota virus include a child who has had watery diarrhea with five to seven days of duration, potentially leading to dehydration. So it's a clinical diagnosis, but you can test the stool for rotavirus antigen. And the treatment is mainly rehydration. With Norwalk virus, what happens is that it lasts for 24 to 48 hours compared to the 5 to 7 days that the rotavirus um, lasted for. And again, it's mainly found in um, patients who have traveled recently on a cruise ship, things like that. Rehydration is going to be the treatment here as well. So 24 to 48 hours Norvoc virus and 5 to 7 days rotavirus. Now what about uh, Bacillus cereus? Well most common finding will be a patient who recently ate or reheated their fried rice and in, in this condition patients will have um, diarrhea which can occur 8 to 16 hours after the ingestion and what's more common is vomiting so if you see vomiting that's more common than diarrhea along with the history of uh, fried rice uh, then that should give you a big clue that this is bacillus cereus the diagnosis is made on accurate history and treatment is going to be oral rehydration and antiemetics and what about staphylococcus aureus well, it's associated with potato salads, cakes, and hams. Usually occurs within one to six hours of eating the food due to a preformed toxin. And the diagnosis is made mainly through an acute, accurate history. But if there is a situation where there's an outbreak, then the diagnosis is made by culturing the staph aureus from the contaminated food. And the treatment is mainly supportive, but patients benefit from oral rehydration and antiemetics. Antibiotics is the wrong choice on the exam in case of Staphylococcus food poisoning. Okay, so go with oral rehydration plus the antiemetics, and that's a big clue. Clostridium perfringens. Well, this is going to be associated with poultry, meat, and damaged canned foods. It's a gram-positive rod that's spore-forming, also an anaerobe. To make the diagnosis, it's based again on history and the type of food that the patient ingested. Treatment will be supported with oral rehydration and antiemetics as needed. And cholera is another abdominal infection and it basically is formed because of the cholera toxin that increases cyclic AMP production. That in turn inhibits absorption and increases secretion of fluid. So cholera toxin increases cyclic AMP and that's what causes the diarrhea. It's associated with shellfish and fecally contained drinking water. Now, what are some of the diagnostic tools? Well, laboratory studies can show electrolyte abnormalities and the big one here is going to be hypokalemia and non-GAP anion uh, metabolic acidosis secondary to the bicarb loss. So it's a non-GAP, okay? It's a big cause of that. Clinical manifestations will include abdominal distension and vomiting, followed by profuse watery diarrhea. And the exam might mention the words rice water diarrhea to give you an even more clue that this is cholera. What about Clostridium perfringens? Well, this is a gram positive spore forming anaerobe, okay? And what happens here is that the patients complain of abdominal pain, distension, and watery diarrhea. Um, and it's usually common in nursing home or hospitalized patients within several weeks or days after the antibiotic use. What you have to watch out for is toxic megacolon as a major complication uh, that can be after perforation has occurred. Also understand that with Clostridium difficile, the diagnosis is by stool examination for C. difficile toxin and in severe cases, the diagnosis can be made more promptly by colonoscopy, uh, which may show pseudomembranous colitis. Now, recent hospitalization or antibiotic use is a critical historical clue that you want to look for. Also, understand that Campylobacter jejuni is a very high yield topic um, for diarrhea. What is the diagnosis and how do you make it? Well, fecal leukocytes are present. 
um, in patients with shigellosis and salmonellosis and that's a big clue and C. jejuni can be cultured from the stool it's associated with Guillain-Barr syndrome and the illness typically lasts for a week um, with a prodrome and fever that can last from 12 to 24 hours with abdominal pain and diarrhea so to treat the patient here you would use erythromycin in addition to rehydration and antiemetics um, Salmonella, okay, is caused mainly by um, places where food is contaminated. It's associated with non-typhoidal salmonolis, and um, milk, poultry, and eggs are some of the more common foods that can lead to salmonella infection. Fecal leukocytes and stool culture are beneficial, definitely, to make the diagnosis. The treatment for salmonella will include um, mainly rehydrating the patient and antibiotics are usually avoided um, and indications will for antibiotics are mainly sickle cell patients immunocompromised um, elderly patients etc and if you have to give antibiotics then choose ampicillin and trimethoprinsulfamethoxazole as your key choices that was a quick board review of some of the most common antibiotics you're likely to see on the COMLEX and USMLE board exam. Um, please visit ComLEXflashcards.com in addition to subscribing to our blog to get daily updates on infectious disease topics and good luck in your preparation throughout medical school.